tiny cracks. Know that I've got everybody's attention. Uh, that's not to be taken literally, but figuratively. Um, the cracks are some of the small things that you find after the machine's been run for a while. And um, like I said uh, in my previous video, th this will be an experience where we'll go through uh, and take each piece, uh, each mechanical mechanism one at a time and look at it very closely and see what it plays, what part it plays in the overall design of the CR-10. Uh, we'll look at the board uh, that the CR-10 uses to get into a price point. They had to use a board that has not much memory on it. You can't run a lot of things on it like you can with the ramps boards. Um, it's a good board. It does the job just. And uh, the bearings that they use, uh, they're due for replacement. If you run your machine a lot, uh, within about two months, you're ready for new bearings. And uh, you'll notice the wheels will start to fragment on it. The plastic starts peeling off the wheels. So uh, these are just a couple of the things. And we're going to actually invent some upgrades to the machine that will um, allow you to turn your speed up. Well, you want to get your sprints faster uh, when you first get your machine Oh, this is wonderful, I can make stuff. But after a while, you start looking at it going, I got other stuff to print. We need to get this thing off the build plate and uh, and get something else on. So we're gonna help you speed that up, show you some of the neat settings. Uh, some of the, um, we're gonna go through some of the logic about moment loads and how moment loads play a part in the vibration of the machine as your build plate goes back and forth. That's where you get the little ringing or ripples in your machine. So stick with me. We'll, we'll do this together. Thank you. Hey folks. Before we get started, I'd like to uh, like to have a few words before I take you out in the shop. Um, some of the uh, things that we're going to do today, I know you're going to want to get your hands dirty and we're going to have to start fixing stuff, but we're going to probably go over all the small things that we'll be covering in, in some of the next videos. Um, and I'd also like to say, um, I have a lot of um, mechanical experience. I wanted to qualify this. Um, I started, um, I was actually the, the youngest um, mechanic to ever attend the Honda Mid Midwest Training Center, Honda Motorcycles, American Honda. And um, I had a, an instructor there who, ingrained on me very early. I was, I believe, a sophomore in high school. And um, I remember I just got my driver's license and I uh, rode my dad's Honda 450 uh, K1 down to Racine, Wisconsin, where the class was being held, a week-long class. And the gentleman's name was Bob Jamison. He was the class instructor and he was also um, the head mechanic on the race team uh, for Honda when they won uh, the 1970 Daytona 200. And uh, it was quite a significant uh, thing for Honda uh, to win that on their uh, four-cylinder Honda 750. It had just come out the year before that previous year. Um, but he ingrained on me uh, some troubleshooting techniques. And the one thing that really stuck with me and that I've carried the rest of my life and it's been quite a while uh, was that you never compensate if you have a problem. You never uh, make an adjustment um, to try to make the bike run right, the first thing you do is you try to get all of the things the way they're supposed to be. You set the valves, you set the carburetors at their base uh, level, the one and a half turns on the screw or whatever it is. And you start from scratch and you make sure everything is right. Then you start finding the problem because most of the time it's an adjustment that's just out of whack or something's wrong with it. And that applies to just about everything that I've worked on in my whole life, including the CR-10. Um, there's a lot of things that happen with the CR-10. Bearings get loose, something happens with the CR-10, and people start looking for other problems. They start buying things for their CR-10, uh, add-ons, uh, gimmicks, whatever. And I'm not saying everything's a gimmick. Um, there's a lot of great stuff out there for them, and I, I'm a, a proponent of uh, hopping up and uh, making your CR-10 the best it, that it can be. But a lot of things are uh, compensation uh, uh, parts. Uh, I'm just going to give you a real quick example. I could go on and on with this, but the um, they have motor dampeners, which is a kind of a rubber motor mount that you mount your stepper motors on to quiet them down. 
um, that's a compensation. And uh, one of the problems you can run into with that is when your motor's shifting back and forth in its jerk stages um, and it's doing a print, those will actually um, set up a, a reverberation or a vibration. It takes, they don't automatically kick back into space, but there's a little bit of overcorrection and back and forth before they finally settle in to their original position. We want to try to make the CR-10 as rigid as we can without anything wiggling around or wobbling around, and this is what's going to give you the really good print. So that being said, uh, some of the fixes today are going to have questions about them. Um, there's been a lot of thought put into them. These are not compensations. They're not what we also call band-aids. We're not going to put a band-aid on stuff. We're going to get right to the heart of what the problem is, and we're going to attack that. Uh, some of these are very simple fixes. Some of them are just when they come to you from the factory. Um, they may be out of adjustment slightly or out of alignment. And that's why some CR10s perform better than others. Uh, sometimes it takes a little while for these to show up. And uh, that's the, hence the, the uh, term that I use, little cracks start showing. Um, some of the things that um, aren't very obvious start be revealing themselves as, uh, as real problems with, with it. But um, there's nothing earth shattering about anything. Nothing can't be fixed on a CR-10. They're just such a simple machine. And we're just gonna go over some of the design flaws, uh, which I consider kind of a crack, and some of the things that wear out or some of the adjustments that get out of whack on them right away. Uh, a lot of people don't look at that. They, they say, oh, is this, there's something wrong with my CR-10, and they start seeking advice from other people, and they start putting Band-Aids on them. And, uh, we're going to dispel any of these uh, myths about the CR-10 and we're going to try to put it into adjustment first and then we're going to move on to uh, adding parts on. We won't get our hands dirty today and put the parts on, but I will take you on a tour and show you some of the things that go wrong with the CR-10 or that happen with the CR-10 and some of the upgraded parts, um, not just bolting another part on, but an actual higher quality part. Uh, bearings is a real good example of that, belts and bearings, and uh, we'll, just, we'll get into that. So. Um, let's go up to the shop. We'll, uh, we'll have a little fun together. Um, we'll look all this stuff over and then um, in my next video I'll take these things one at a time and we'll, we'll tackle them. Um, appreciate you being here. I know you've got other stuff to do and other videos to watch but um, thanks for watching mine. I'm gonna make this as direct and non-boring as possible. If I drop a screwdriver, you're not gonna see me fiddling around looking for it or something. So we're gonna get it right into this thing and uh, make every moment of this video quality. Um, so thanks for stopping in. We will uh, back. We'll be back shortly. Thank you. Okay, I promised you some shop time. Um, I've got my little 300 little sweetheart out here. I also have a. A 500S uh, custom uh, in in the CAD room. Uh, we'll look at that in a little bit too. There's a couple uh, additional um, features on that that I'd like to go over um, with that. But you'll see. Um, we'll start out with the something that we see on here quite often um, is the glass. Uh, people using glass as a build sheet, and um, I like the fact that people are seeking uh, the IKEA mirrors um, out, something a little thinner and lighter. Um, I don't think that is the answer to the problem, but it's a step in the right direction. Um, you'll see here I have some aluminum foil underneath here I use as a shim. This uh, had a little swale in the, in the middle of the table, and we just compensated, fixed that with some aluminum foil. This was a temporary thing. I have a, uh, another fix for this. Um, we're going to be using a lighter build sheet on this. Um, one of the problems with your prints, and I'm going to say this is the biggest thing, biggest combination of two things. One is the frame wants to wobble. The other is this is what's making it wobble, all of this inertia going back and forth on here. So um, we're just going to clip this. We're just going to weigh this glass, and we're going to see how much weight is going back and forth and, and how we can eliminate that. This is a, this is a lot of weight. Uh, glass is basically sand that's been melted and condensed, and... Uh, and this is a, you can feel it, it's, it's pretty heavy, so I'm going to turn this on. Okay, our glass weighs two pounds and six ounces. Two pounds, six ounces, or one kilogram um, minus 0.2. 
Um, and that, that's a lot of weight when you're shifting it and you're going into some of these smaller uh, jerk moves and this is going back and forth. Um, it, it wants to, when it's going in one direction, it wants to put all this pressure on both the stepper motor and the belt, the whole drive line, the whole machine shaking, um, probably the worst. Uh, the thing that really suffers the most from this is this is this gantry. We're going to call it the gantry. This is a gantry style frame and um, we're going to talk a little bit about the design here. Uh, they did a real nice job of, the, of, of making these, of designing the CR-10. They got in on a price point. They made it um, affordable. That's a beautiful thing right there. I was able to buy one and um, I wasn't really in the market for one but because of the price and because of all the hype that was being said about these it was just a no-brainer for me. I just, you know, uh, dumped three hundred and sixty-five dollars. I think it may have been three eighty-five to my door, um, and it has just performed. I was able to. I, you, if you look around the shop, you'll see I've got a, a lot of CNC machines here, and I've built and designed a lot of CNC machines in my life. So I recognize this machine uh, for its mechanical um, aptitude. Um, when I bought it or just before I bought it and I went ahead and made the pur purchase. Um, I had designed a machine similar to this back in the late 90s, early 2000s. It was for a hot wire foam cutting and it was a gantry style machine. And I had the same um, challenge, the same design challenge when I made that and how I quelled the uh, vibration of the quick moves back and forth um, was with these guy, with guy wires. and. Uh, You'll see these kits, it's a Thingiverse thing where they've got the big, I've got them on my other machine, by the way, we'll take a look at that in just a second. Um, they've got the big lugs out here and you've got threaded, 3 8 inch threaded rod or 5 16 threaded rod out here. It just doesn't, it doesn't need to be. Um, not only that, but when you triangulate one side of this frame only, th those, um, let me see if we got, a good shot of this. All good design uh, machines have are triangulated. That's the strength. If you look at a bridge or anything else, you'll see the triangles or the triangulation. Um, what it is is it connects all of the uh, leverage points of the structure uh, with another part of the machine and continues the load uh, throughout the whole structure instead of just on one part, one weak part. So the other, those other um, Thingiverse gantry braces had came up to here, but what happens is when this wants to go back and forth, it wasn't triangulated on this side of the machine. And you just transferred this force, this back and forth motion, you've turned this into a fulcrum. If you can kind of imagine, this is where it's going to pivot on because this can't go up and down. It transfers that motion into the Z forces and it will actually vibrate this up and down when it's doing a little wonky little print. You can put your hand underneath this rail and you can actually feel that table bouncing up and down against your fingers. Um, so we've had a couple, we've got a couple answers for a uh, fix for that. Uh, one is this guy wire kit and this is just works wonders right here. I use it without the extra feet. Um, I will eventually put the feet on here. I move this around a lot and those require leveling them to the surface or using it on to fully take advantage of uh, stretching that weight out or distributing that weight that this is trying to push down very little because it doesn't have that same fulcrum effect. But it, it, you will experience a little bit of up and down movement with this. So. Um, that's our fix for that. Um, the CR10s you see in the, uh, when, when you get uh, some of these hypes on TV about the CR10, how wonderful they are. Did you notice they always show it doing a base? Anything high is always a base. When it's in base mode, it's going around real smooth. It doesn't have that, that jerk motion in it. And that's one of the reasons why they demonstrate them in base mode. So um, I print real stuff here in my shop. We do cast aluminum pieces and I do uh, patterns or forms, uh, hence our name 3D print to form. Uh, we make forms and we actually do lost PLA as well as lost wax casting here. 
and cast aluminum. Um, so for me, it was important to get at the heart of these problems and fix them. So, okay, let's go, let's go with next. Um, this wheel right here is loose. This is your, this is your X beam right here. And the load, um, the, all the Z motion is pushing up on this beam and it's pushing up on one side. This is a single Z lead screw. And when you're pushing up on this, if there's nothing supporting this, you can see a problem here. And you know, it's not a real big problem. Probably for what most people are printing, it's not a big deal. But imagine the, the weight of this coming over and now you're exerting more weight on this side of the of the beam and you're, you're gonna push down on this. So you're gonna get some irregularity in your Z layers, which is a very important part of your print. Um, really, there's no fix for this. You can, as long as these bearings are still within ser serviceable life, you can loosen up on these and you can kind of push them over and there's a little bit of slop in the holes, in the mounting holes for these axles and you can kind of push that slop out of them and then retighten them real carefully you can get that out of there, but these have already been tightened and uh, not even a week ago and they're loose again. And it's just, it's a matter of where. You're eventually gonna have to replace uh, these bushings. We have eccentric bushings and it, it's something, we've got one over here on this side. There's only one, double check that, where I'm a big liar. There's only one eccentric bushing on this whole machine. This whole beam depends on these wheels to make contact with this rail with one, it's in here. That one's spinning freely. I'm gonna bring the camera over so everybody can see that. You'll see this is a regular spacer on here. You see it's just a round spacer, a tubular spacer underneath you can see there's a hex nut. There's a hex nut. It's over the top of my finger now. It's in the shadow, so you can't see it. But it's a it's a hex nut, and you put a little um, I think it's an eight millimeter wrench fits on there, eight or nine, and you loosen up the, the screw or the axle to this uh, to this wheel bolt, and you can uh, loosen it up slightly and tweak that until that eccentric bushing comes around it makes this pattern as you're screwing it around and you can as you're screwing it make it come closer and push the wheel into the rail further but only being one you're actually going to just move the rail over and push these two wheels into it one of these wheels or the other may not necessarily be on the same trajectory or the same plane so it's not a very good system why they didn't for the cost of those why they didn't uh, install those, I, I, it's beyond me. Um, but we have a kit for that, and I'll show you that, and I'll show you the installation of it, where we have a drill guide that fits on here so you make your hole nice and straight. We have a 7.2 millimeter drill bit, which is the size of the inside surface or flange of that eccentric nut. And uh, you replace these regular spacers with the eccentric spacers. So. Uh, we're now able to take and put an uh, equal load on all of these wheels, an equal amount of pressure, and you don't get this then. So that's a real important thing. Um, another subject. I've designed CNC systems before with stepper motors. They have permanent magnets inside the motors. And um, one of the problems with that is if you're, you turn off your controller, this turns into a little generator. And if I push this far enough, I can actually make the screen light up. It's actually kicking electricity back. And that's not good for your control board. You can actually burn out a drive uh, doing that. So I try not to do it. But if you've ever noticed, like if you're done with a print, you pull this out, your screen lights up after your machine is off. Um, that's what the problem is. So everybody be real careful with that. There's a way to uh, solder in diodes where the current only goes one direction. It'll come to the motor, but it won't feed back through to the drive. So. Um, that's another thing we'll get into later. We're going to talk about boards and electronics and everything else, but 
The main problem with these machines is the mechanics on them, and that's what we're going to hit first. So um, I've invented a bed leveler, a touch bed leveler system for this, where it uses the nozzle to touch the build surface, um, and it works like uh, any other bed leveler system. It goes around and it, it makes a, a, a uh, mesh of the table so that if your table's not level, um, it compensates by printing down in the valleys and up on the hills, so um, that's, a, that's a real nice feature. We're going to also get into that. I'll show you how that works. Um, another thing I want to talk about is your, your levelers. Now, I'm going to pull the camera off the tripod there. Yeah. And we're going to look at how these bed leveler systems work on here. Uh, you'll notice there's a spring right there. This plate down here that the bottom of the spring sits on and then the, uh, at the top of this, if you look through the glass, you can see there's a countersunk Phillips screw at the top of it. And if you, if your table, I'm sorry, if your, um, if these leveler um, adjustments aren't aren't pulled tight so that the the spring is really grabbing onto them, uh, they'll actually move. When your table is in one of those jerk moves. The table will keep moving, and the spring will allow it to move back and forth on there. There's a, there's a small amount of that wobble. Um, one of the things you can do just as a quick fix, you can put more washers in here so your spring, when you tighten it up, your spring is more compressed in there, and that usually makes that go away. Um, but um, that's something you need to address also on these. Um, I'll get into the electronics on this later. Um, that's about all we have to go over uh, today. There's a few other little cracks, and um, uh, one of the designs is the extruder. Some of the earliest extruders, from what I understand, these, are, these have been um, uh, molded, actually, uh, pressure molded, the way they normally make plastic pieces. Uh, die cast rather um, the, the this stepper motor gets so hot in some cases now it doesn't on this one but it did on my uh, 5s uh, that it will uh, stress the plastic up here this plastic's not made for high temperatures and you'll start developing cracks there's a, a lot of pressure this spring is really uh, there's a lot of tension on this spring right here that's what pushes the bearing against your your little capstan drive, the little gear that feeds the uh, the filament in, or actually the, uh, the you know the function of your extruder is that, um, and it'll crack. That'll break this piece. There's an aluminum, what they call a Mark Eight, um, on the market. Um, there's and there's some cheap Chinese knockoffs. There's some good ones, bad ones. Um, my friends over at McEwen sell a really good upgraded one, where there's an uh, inlet side. Um, that allows you to put uh, PTFE uh, Teflon feed in here, and then you can trim it so that if you're doing something like um, flexible filament, it doesn't, when it uh, back, uh, it, the extruder uh, backs up or retracts, it won't gobble up, make a big knot right here. Um, and that's a real typical thing with these uh, non-guided um, extruders. Uh, so look them up, McEwen uh, 3D on the web. Um, I also used um, that PFT, T PTFE tubing for the Bowden feed tube. You know, that stuff's like a dime a dozen. You don't know where that came from. It could be 1.75 millimeter. Very difficult to measure it. Um, you want to make sure all of your filament is going to feed through there. It was just a couple bucks for this piece. I got this uh, is a Capricorn product. I'll probably put them on my website um, if we can uh, work something out with them. It gets one-stop shop at our place. Um, the best stuff right here. It's like a self-lubricated. Uh, you don't have to worry about lubricating your um, filament, which brings in another uh, brings in other issues with this. And um, it's it's just a good good thing to make sure that all the basic things are covered on your machine. Um, all of the P 
pieces when they come are assembled, but they don't say that they're tight. They don't necessarily tighten them. So it's a really good thing to go through this and tighten everything, every moving part. Make sure your belts are aligned properly. This one's kind of creeping off to the right side because the, the tensioner is, is off to one side. Same thing with this one. I don't know if you can see that, but this is typically how you, you get them from the factory. And, you know, they, they work fine. That worked great. You can see the belt um, is over to this, favoring this side of the extrusion over here. And it just, those little things, those little adjustments are what really makes your machine run. I've only had this machine for about a week now. And uh, we're just trying out uh, some, some parts on it. And we have some really neat goodies. Um, the other thing I hear a lot of complaints about with this is... There's a, the micro SD card in here. A lot of guys print through their um, simplified 3D or through their print program or Oct Octopi or whatever. Um, we're just talking simple basic uh, machine here. I got one of these extension ribbon cables, plugs into here. That way you're not flipping it in and out all the time. And then I use a, a larger SD card. Um, out here, they're easier to handle anyway, easier to keep track of. Um, I've got a number of them. I just do what I call the sneaker net. You take them back and forth to the computer. Or if I'm using my Simplify 3D, I plug right into this and control it right off of that. So um, that's, you know, that's basically some of the real simple things you can do to this machine to really make it, make it nice. Um, I mentioned how the, this goes up and down. It also allows, when this is loose, uh, it also allows this beam to twist this way. So um, that wasn't really a problem on my other machine because I have a dual Z on the on the 5S. Um, and so this wasn't a problem, so I kind of left this slide on the 5S, and all of a sudden I put the um, touch probe, which is where the, the tip actually comes down. It's made for a V6. The tip comes down and actually touches the build surface and does the same thing the other ones do, but without all the hoopla. Um, and what happens is when it pushes, the tip pushes down, it flexes the beam over. So it was inaccurate. It was not an accurate way of checking the, the level surface. So I had to go and put some of these uh, nuts in here. The nut kit, I believe you get five or six of them and you get a, a drill bit with it. Uh, the drill bit itself is about what you'd pay for the drill bit to get the whole kit. We just bought 500 drill bits, so we got it cheap enough. We can throw a drill bit in with the kit. Um, I would really look into that. You can print the guide for this. It's basically a flat flange with a 7.2, maybe a little bit bigger for clearance, uh, cylinder that goes above it. And what that does is you can hold it right while it's on the machine. If you don't have access to a drill press, you can do it right on the machine. Take this axle out. You can hold that flange right up to the bolt with your drill, and you can drill a nice straight hole right through that, nice clean hole right through there. And um, you know, that this, it's just a real nice way to make your machine, tune it in and make it accurate. So I won't waste any more time. I think we've gone over some of the real basic things that will make your CR10 perform a lot better right out of the box without going out and buying a bunch of stuff for it. Um, we do, however, have some of these things on our website. Um, we're not out to make a killing on them or anything. We get a decent price on them. Um, I resell a lot of the stuff that I resell. Uh, for instance, the wheels. These bearings will go out in the wheels. The plastic starts to shred. If you've had your CR10 for a while, you know what I'm talking about. You look underneath it, and you see sh shards of plastic underneath. And uh, sometimes a shard of that plastic will get in the bearing or some of your, your build stuff, and it will stop that bearing because these are shielded bearings, but they're not sealed bearings and uh, they'll stop that wheel, they'll put the brakes on that wheel, then as your machine goes back and forth, it wears a slot in it. And um, if everybody kind of wants to do this test, um, where you slide your table back and forth, and you'll feel lump, 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 every time a wheel goes past that spot, you'll feel that in your wheel. So uh, it's a little harder to discern that you're having a problem with, with this. You actually have to inspect it. But we have, I bought bearings real high-speed steel 
um, sealed with the real rubber seals in them like you'd get an automotive or a motorcycle or something. Um, sealed bearings. Um, and then we have the correct size spacer in between the bearings. And the reason I say that is because that's a, another problem they have with these. Um, and the bearings, when I assemble them, I put the correct size spacers in between so that the inner race on the bearing is pushing against that instead of the bearings having space between them. And when you tighten a bolt down on them, it puts side pressure on the ball bearing. They're not made to take that force. Um, but if you have a spacer between them, the correct spacer, when you put this force on them, the load is transferred through the middle race and you're not putting that pressure on the balls. You're not uh, uh, binding the balls on here. And uh, that's one of the pr another problem with the CR-10. Uh, not only do they not have sealed bearings, and I want, want everybody to do this test. Go ahead and loosen up this wheel and just take your, your finger and just feel. You're going to hardly be able to feel it, but just run this wheel like this and you'll feel a little kind of a grinding feeling to it when you're running this bearing. That's, that's a bad bearing or that's a bearing that's been torqued and has that side pressure on it. Um, once they get this little nick or that little uh, feeling in them, the bearing's gone. Um, a lot of bearings are designed at low speed that they'll run like that, and that's fine. Um, high speed, this bearing would destroy itself in no time if you did that. Um, so that being said, you know, all of the parts uh, you get have been carefully examined, carefully uh, thought out, and um, we've sourced just the best stuff uh, for our products. So. Um, we're going to take one more little tour of my, uh, my S5 Custom, and we're going to show you a few little things about that. Uh, in the upcoming videos, we're going to talk about the electronics on here. There's a lot of guys that do a very thorough and very great job at explaining the electronics on these things, and I won't bore you with that. I'm going to stay in, kind of in my te territory of what I'm good at, and um, I'll make reference to whoever it is. Um, you can go watch their video if there's something that I've seen that I find interesting, and rather than try to explain it. To you, I'll just have them watch their video. Very thorough, very good. Um, I'm not going to name any names right now. Uh, but one thing I will say about the electronics on here is there's a crack. Um, the boards that they use for these to get into that price point that they uh, got into so everybody could afford a CR10 and they became as popular as they are, they used a little, I believe it's called a Mendel board, and it was designed just for the CR10. And unlike the other boards out there, most of the popular boards, are, they use a ramps, 1.3 or 1.4 board. And um, this is typical only to the CR-10. You won't find this board on any other machine. Uh, problem with that is that, it, like the cell phones, if you buy one from AT&T, it needs to be jailbroke if you want to take it to another um, provider, service provider. Same thing with the board. If you want to change the Marlin configuration in here, you'll need to uh, put what they call a, um, a bootloader into it. You can buy a little Arduino and you, uh, you bootload so that you can get past that block that they have in there. And you can then manipulate some of the settings in here. I'll tell you why they do that right now. Um, not only to um, uh, make their board exclusive or to keep it closed, closed source. Can I say that word? Um, taking a step away from open source. Um, their board is very limited with memory. There's only a few things you can put on this board besides what this is already capable of right now. I know the um, CR-10S, they loaded the latest uh, Marlin in here uh, when they ship them out. And they enable, in the Marlin, they enable the lines in there for you to use the uh, low filament uh, detector on that and every time you enable something like that you use up memory on it and you have to disable something else all of the neat controls that you get when you buy your CR10 you're able to re set your retrack in here and your retrack speed and your XY jerk and everything in there you start taking the ability to do that out of here you, st you have to start there's a little sum line on the bottom when you're loading your Marlin and it's telling you you're running out of memory and you want to stay under 98%. Uh, that's pretty close, too close for comfort. And um, you want to make sure that you're taking something away when you're adding something, or you could go over that 
very easily and your machine will malfunction. So um, that's all I have to say about that. And we'll go into detail on that later. I uh, just want you to know that's what a CR-10 is and that's what these are. They're great little machines. They operate in their little parameter just perfectly. There's some neat little gadgets you can buy for them. Heck, you know, these big giant fang fans and all these other things, um, they'll take a stock CR-10 uh, heater block and they'll cool it off so that it shuts off on, <laughs> on low heat. You don't need all that. You know, there's some specific great things you can do to your machine without over overcompensating. I think Shrek said it now I'm in the movie. Um, you don't need to overcompensate uh, when you've got one of these little machines. They're just beautiful the way they are, in fact. Um, I think that they're dollar for dollar. I think they're the best machine on the market. And uh, you can pay more for one and probably get some better results out of them. But um, I think an entry-level machine like this, I don't think you're going to find one for that price in that price range that you can do this much with. And um, I love mine. I've got the, like I say, I'm going to real quick show you the 5S and then uh, we're running out of time here real quick. Uh, but we're going to take you in the other room. Stay with me. Okay, I promised you a shot of the uh, 5S or S5, whatever they're calling them. Um, you'll see I did some enhancements on mine. I haven't put the guy wire uh, guy wires on here yet. Uh, actually, I was going to do a test to compare this Thingiverse system with my guy wire system and show you the Z bounce uh, that we're getting. I've already run these tests already. Um, I have a app on my phone, the Vibra. I think it's called Vibra Sensor or something, and it's very very good. It collects data real nice. Um, you'll see on here I have that uh, bed leveler system that I invented. It flows around and it touches the table in nine places. Um, I could touch the table in as many places as I want, 40 places, but um, we talked about the board on the CR-10 out there. Um, if you get an easy abler, easy able um, system, which is a good system, uh, it doesn't have to touch your bed. It has to check a number of times and then take the average of each time that it checks. I think it's five times or nine times in each spot. And I, I don't know who has that kind of time, but Mine does it twice in each spot, and because I've got the Ramps 1.4 board in here, it has a gobs of memory. I can run two separate Zs. Um, the CR10s, you have to share a Z port. It actually, um, you hook them in, in parallel. They actually solder into the wires when they make a, a dual Z system for that. Um, what else does this do? Oh, this came with the uh, sensor, the filament mount sensor. Uh, which is a real simple thing on the ramps board. It doesn't, you know, these things don't really tax the amount of memory that this has. This has a chip in it that, um, bar none, is the kind of the um, standard of the industry for doing this. Um, and you'll also see, um, I use a copper uh, bed on here. We talked about all that weight going back and forth. Um, I have these specially made up. This is a 16th inch thick PC board, and I have them put extra copper on both sides. Uh, that is a very good build surface. I don't see anybody else using that. I've been using it for about four months now. It's, there's no scrape marks or I don't have any problems getting stuff off here. It sticks really well. I use hairspray if I want it to stick. Um, I'll, I, I guarantee it's going to work great with hairspray. It releases when it cools down just like the glass does. Um, it does everything the glass does uh, except it heats up almost exactly twice as fast as the glass parts. So that's all I'm going to say about this. Uh, there's that Marcade extruder on there. Make sure you get the fine-toothed um, uh, gear on there. And they're a little bit bigger in diameter, so you're going to have to go in and set your steps. Um, I think it's about a 10%, 9% um, difference in the amount of steps per millimeter or per inch or per 100 millimeters, however it's calibrated. Um, but uh, that's pretty much it. Um, once again, um, this video probably turned out a little bit longer than what I wanted, but I gave you um, enough information to let me know kind of what's coming up in the rest of the series of videos on the CR-10. And I hope you enjoy it. Uh, stay tuned for the little epilogue I have uh, after this. And um, I hope you uh, support me by subscribing to my channel and visit my website. Just see what I've got. Um, if you don't see something on there or something I've described, doesn't make sense. There's an email address technical at that email comes directly to me, and um, we just uh, 
just love working with people. I'm basically retired, but um, that's a kind of a funny word because I don't think anybody in my uh, that does what I do ret actually retires. So anyway, this is uh, this has been a pleasure uh, for me to present this. So uh, stay tuned for the epilogue. Thank you very much. Well, there you have it. Uh, that about wraps it up for today. Um, I only want to say that uh, this is something I really enjoy doing. And thanks for letting me come into your homes and um, checking out my videos. Um, I've been a professional machine designer most of my life. And before that, a professional mechanic and um, troubleshooter. And this is really ingrained in me. If I can help anybody out uh, figuring out uh, some of the inadequacies of their machines or uh, teach anybody anything, um, it, it fulfills my fulfills my destiny. So um, if you folks would do me a favor and just support me in uh, not monetarily uh, necessarily, but uh, just like my videos, subscribe. I've got a lot of neat stuff coming up. Uh, I've got a website. We uh, design and build. I've got some talented people that work here with me. We design and build all of the parts that are on the website. You won't find them anywhere else. Um, if we do have to go outsource our parts uh, to China or another country, we only pick the best, the top material. Um, we're not in this to make a bunch of money. We're in this to supply everybody with what they need to enhance their 3D printing experience. So um, please come back and visit me and I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I did. My name is Dave Ashenbrenner and thank you very much and I hope to see you again. Thank you.